This is our universe. Man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. We choose to go to the moon. And we have deep questions about its fundamental nature. How old is our universe? How big is our universe? What is it made of? And why are we here? These are the questions that puzzle all of us, but that cosmologists attempt to answer. For millennia, humanity's greatest thinkers have studied the cosmos in hopes of uncovering the universe's deepest mysteries. But in the past hundred years, we have finally obtained answers to some of these crucial questions. We were very confident now that we can go after the rarest, which is the Higgs. I think we have it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. We have seen what we thought was unseeable. We have seen and taken a picture of a black hole. Like any other area of physics, we seek a simple equation to describe the universe's evolution. And today, I'd like to derive this equation with all of you. But to figure out how our universe evolves, we have to figure out what type of universe we live in in the first place. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was widely thought that the universe was static and that it was at least temporally infinite. That is, that the universe has existed forever. And so in 1912, when Vesto Slipher first observed that galaxies had a redshift, implying that the universe might be expanding, large debate ensued. Of the many scientists who pursued the study of the expanding universe, Friedman, Robertson, Walker, and Lemaitre independently came up with a simple yet powerful model to quantify an expanding universe. This model is called the FLRW universe. In 1927, Lemaitre observed that galaxies are moving away from one another. Two years later, Hubble's observations allowed him to identify a mathematical relationship involving that recessional velocity of galaxies and the expansion rate of our universe. All this to say, the FLRW model catapulted cosmology into a new era. So let's get into it. What FLRW proposed in the end was the simplest form of a non-static universe, an expanding, homogeneous, and isotropic space-time. Let's break that down. Homogeneous means that the universe looks the same everywhere. One way you could think about this is if you imagine yourself in a dense forest. If you were to walk to a different location in the forest, it would pretty much look like the place where you started since the forest is homogeneous. Isotropic means that the universe looks the same in all directions. If we head back to the forest and look around in all directions, it would all look the same, such that we wouldn't be able to orient ourselves in general. Now we have to be careful. I don't literally mean that all the trees are identical copies of one another and that they're perfectly evenly spaced in the forest. But I mean in general, in the grand scheme of things, the forest is homogeneous and isotropic. It looks the same everywhere and in all directions. And it's in this sense that we mean the same for the universe. We mean that the universe on the largest scales is statistically homogeneous and isotropic. And since cosmologists are interested in studying these largest scales, we will see that these two assumptions can take us very far. This is the FLRW metric in polar coordinates. This A over here is what we call the scale factor, and it basically tells you how the spatial components of the metric grow as a function of time. The parameter K is called the curvature. For those of you who are familiar with GR or differential geometry, this is not the same thing as the Ricci or Riemann curvature. This curvature only has to do with the spatial components of the universe, not the curvature of the entire space-time manifold. If K is negative, we say that the universe is open. The surface of the saddle shape is a geometry that has this curvature. So if you were a two-dimensional being living in a two-dimensional open universe, it might look something like this. If K is positive, we say that the universe is closed. And a two-dimensional example of this type of geometry is the surface of this sphere. 
And if k is equal to zero, we say that the universe is flat or critical. And a two-dimensional example of this geometry is a sheet. Keep this one in mind because it'll be important later. You can also represent this information as a metric tensor like this. So here, this GTT entry corresponds to the coefficients of the DT squared term. The next entry along the diagonal corresponds to the DR squared term and so on. As you can see, there are no entries on the off diagonal because there were no cross terms like, for example, dr d theta in the equation of our metric. We say that the metric is diagonal. Now, we want to study expansion, so what we really want is an equation involving that scale factor a, and our best bet at achieving that is using Einstein's field equations, which tell us how a spacetime evolves in the presence of matter and how matter behaves in the presence of a curved spacetime. G mu nu is the Einstein tensor and encodes all of the information about our metric, about our spacetime. T mu nu encodes all of the information about what's in our space, and this g over here is just Newton's gravitational constant. Altogether, these 16 equations, and yes, there really are 16 of them here, perfectly describe how mass energy warps spacetime, and subsequently how mass energy behaves in that warped spacetime. So FLR and W said, okay, we got our metric. But what is T? What is the stuff that's in our universe? And they said, let's just take the simplest form of matter we can think of, a perfect fluid. The stress energy tensor for a perfect fluid looks like this. The first entry along the diagonal is the energy density of the fluid, and the rest of the diagonal entries encode the pressure of the fluid. So that's great, we already know what T mu nu is, so now I'm just going to use the metric to compute the Einstein tensor. This takes a little bit of work, but once you do the math, we get these two equations, the Friedman equations, where the dot here denotes a time derivative. Today, we're going to focus on the first one, which is often just referred to as the Friedman equation, because it's this equation that tells us about the expansion rate of our universe, the expansion rate we call the Hubble parameter. But we're not quite done yet. See this row? This is the total energy density of our universe. But to really understand this equation, we need to know exactly what types of energy densities make up the universe and how each of them get diluted as the universe expands. So we can ask ourselves, how do energy densities in general get diluted? Let's consider a small volume of gas. Here, the side lengths of this box we will call A, and we're going to let them vary as a function of time. So quite easily, we can see that the volume of this box is just a cubed. Now, since this is a closed system, we can write down the thermodynamic relation, where du is a small change in the total energy, T is the temperature, ds is a small change in the entropy, P is the pressure, and dv is a small change in the volume. So dv is just the differential of v defined above. We get the total energy by multiplying the energy density by the volume. ds is zero, because remember we assumed homogeneity, which extremizes entropy. Alright, so if we plug all this in, do a little algebra, and make use of the equation of state parameter w, which is the ratio of the pressure to the energy density of the fluid, we get this nice, ordinary differential equation. If we solve this ODE, we end up with this equation, relating the density of some fluid to the scale factor. Typically, we normalize A such that today, the scale factor has a value of 1, and in the past, the scale factor is some fraction of how large it is in the present. With that, rho naught here denotes the energy density when A is equal to 1, that is, the energy density in the present. Now we're really almost done. Let's consider three different types of energy density that could be in our universe. First off, radiation. We know from thermodynamics that W is equal to one-third, and plugging this into our equation, we find that the energy density of radiation decays like one over A to the power of four. This may seem weird, but this actually makes sense. If we have a bunch of photons, represented here as little waves, in a box, and the box grows, then the density of the photons decreases, 
and gets diluted by a factor of A cubed, by the volume. But we also know that light red shifts as the universe expands, which also makes photons lose energy, and we pick up another factor of 1 over A. Altogether, we get an energy dilution of 1 over A to the power of 4. Great. Next, let's consider pressureless dust, aka matter. Since it's pressureless, W is equal to 0, and rho decays like 1 over A to the power of 3. This should also make sense because the energy density of matter just dilutes by a factor of 1 over the volume. Here we don't pick up an extra factor of 1 over A because matter, unlike light, does not redshift. Last but not least, we can consider a strange type of matter, where W is equal to negative 1, and so rho doesn't actually scale with A. This type of energy density never dilutes. And this should bother you. This is what we call dark energy. When people ask, what is dark energy? This is dark energy. It's just some sort of matter for which the scale factor does not decay. We don't truly know what it is physically, but this is how we characterize it. All right, we did it. If we plug all these density scalings back into our original Friedman equation, we get the full Friedman equation. This is the equation that describes the entire universe's expansion. Tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Roger, twin. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. One of the most mind-blowing things to me about modern cosmology is we've actually gone out and measured these densities and found out how abundant our universe is in radiation, matter, and dark energy. Based on our best measurements, the universe is almost entirely composed of matter and dark energy. Our universe is about 30% matter and 70% dark energy. And of that matter, roughly 5% is the type of matter we're familiar with. The other 25% is what we call dark matter. We also measure K to be zero, meaning that we live in a flat universe. This universe, that is one with dark energy, dark matter, and a flat spatial curvature, is often referred to as the flat lambda CDM model. And this is our current concordance model of cosmology. But things get even more interesting. Since we know how each type of matter dilutes as the universe expands, we can make a plot of what type of matter dominates the universe at any given time. From this plot of relative abundances, we see that at early times radiation dominates. Matter dominates at slightly later times, but since dark energy never dilutes, it will dominate the energy density of our universe until the end of time. And so, where are we along this cosmic timeline? We're here, when remember, dark energy dominates our energy budget, but not by much. Isn't it peculiar that we live in a time when the relative abundances of matter and dark energy are of the same order of magnitude? This is called the coincidence problem. Now, we still have a lot of questions that need answering. What is dark energy? What is dark matter? Why are we here? Why now? And what happened before the Big Bang? But that's the beauty of science. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. <laughs>